as a whole, when I think of the Eagles organization, the fact that they can get a left tackle after a left tackle after a left tackle after a left tackle is so impressive. Now, we don't know what Andre Dillard's career is going to be at this point. It looks good. It looks like it has solid potential. But as an organization, the fact that we can consistently go out there and get left tackles who can perform at an elite level is something that can't go unnoticed. And you take a look around the league, it's not easy to do. Not every organization can pick left tackles the way that the Eagles have. I would argue that there are more good starting quarterbacks than there are good starting left tackles. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. And I I think that's what makes it even more special. Like, it's one thing to get a franchise quarterback, right? It's it's one thing to get a Wentz, Goff, Rodgers. You know, it's one thing to draft the quarterback. But if you think about it, there's really only, what, eight or ten like legit, good, good, really good left tackles in this league and everybody else is just mediocre or poor. And we consistently snag them. Trey Thomas, John Runyon, Jason Peters, now Dillard. Well, you mentioned the Houston Texans, and dare we go down this path, Josh? Which path is that, about Clowney? Clowney. Because you hear these reports, it might not take as much as you think to go out and get him. Now, we can throw some hypotheticals out there. You know, you hear, it's, is it possible to, to send a draft pick in Nelson Aguilar, or they want to tackle, so maybe a, a draft pick in Vitae? Would you be interested in that? For a one-year rental, keep in mind, you can't attack his contract. So, at this point, it would be a one-year contract for Clowney? So, I wouldn't do it. And here's why. I think what's being overlooked here is, one, he's coming to a totally different defensive scheme. They're running a 3-4 down there in Houston. He would have to change then to hand-in-the-dirt lineman. And we remember Connor Barwin when they tried to make a switch with him? It didn't work out so well. And now, I'm not saying that Clowney and Barwin's in the same category, but it's the same defense. It's that 3-4 to 4-3 change. And I'm not saying Clowney can't make the change, but with it being so close to this season, it's a little unfair, I think, to him to make the asset change, number one. Number two... You didn't build this team the way you did to displace somebody. So who's now all of a sudden not getting X number of reps per game? Is it Brandon Graham? No, it would be Derek Barnett. Is it Vinny Curry? It would be Derek Barnett. He would be the guy that comes in the rotation because he just came off of an injury. And and what is he? We don't know. Well, when he was healthy, he was really good. Sure, but he had surgery now. Well, so did half the league. Right, but I'm just saying, you, you're going to expect the kid to come in, and it, it wouldn't be a bad thing if Derek Barnett was your... It's a rotation anyway. It's not like, sure, he loses time, but he's still going to get a lot. But if you're, if you're going to give up X number of players and assets... I don't. It's not as much as what you're making well, but, it seem to be. But though. hear me out, okay? okay? If you do give up Aguilar in a draft pick, or Vitae in a draft pick, or, heck, let's go overkill and say it's Vitae, Aguilar, and a third-round pick. I'm just throwing out for... You know, whoever out there wants to throw out a scenario. Do you think you're going to keep Clowney in Philadelphia if he only plays the 40 to 40, 50 percent of the snaps? Well, Nelson's going to walk anyway, though. So Nelson Aguilar's on a one year rental. Keep that in mind. He's not going to come back here. We're not going to. We're probably well, not nobody keep cares because you drafted JGR Sega Whiteside. But so that's my point. Why not get rid of Nelson Aguilar and you bring in Clowney, who would be your best defensive end? Automatically, he would be your best defensive end. So you bring him in here, and you lose your fourth or third wide receiver, and you can plug in J.J. Ortega-Whiteside there. So if you think of the trade-off, I mean, if that's what it takes to get him, I would definitely look into it. And I know how he's thinking of options to make this work, I would assume. Yeah, look, I don't, I'm not saying the trade can't happen, but I'm very wary of making a guy who's been a stand-up blitzer and turning him into a hand-in-the-dirt kind of guy, you know, a, you know, a 4-3 defensive end, when he hasn't had the training camp to make the conversion. I'm not saying he can't make the conversion, but remember, one of the reasons why Brandon Graham struggled earlier in his Eagles career, because he was playing out of position. They were asking him to play that outside linebacker in the 3-4 and be a blitzer, he's a hundred times better as a 4-3 end. So I think that one of the problems is that you bring in Clowney, you're assuming he's going to be the best defensive end, but what if he doesn't make the changeover very smoothly? And that's one of the reasons why, as was reported last night, 
he met with the Dolphins because the Dolphins run a 3-4, a defense that he's already familiar with. Well, he came out and said he would want to be with Seattle or Eagles over Miami. I think that's just well, an option for him. Well, let's clarify that. Adam Schefter reported that his people are saying that he prefers XYZ teams. It doesn't mean that that's really where he's going to go. It's kind of like... No, because we have like, to be remember, on every... We remember would have the to whole Anthony up. Davis thing? When he came out through the agent, through the Woj, and said, I want to go to these teams. Remember what team kept being brought up every single time? The Knicks. We all knew he wasn't going to the Knicks. We, first of all, it wasn't financially possible. The, the Knicks couldn't make the deal with the, the way their situation with the cap was and their draft picks until a certain time. Like how Boston couldn't make a deal until after X date for him because of the way their cap situation was. So we knew that that was a long shot, but it kept being mentioned. I think the Eagles were mentioned, not because he's legitimately trying to come to Philadelphia, but because I think that they're trying to leverage that against other teams that he's more likely to go to. That's possible, but I don't think it's out of the question for us to be able to make the move. And you you claim that the scheme would be a big difference, which factors in, it does, but you're taking a risk on Derek Barnett coming in here and being a double-digit sack guy. Well, then you'll take a risk on Clowney being a guy that can make the but switch. You don't I mean, need, you're taking a risk. But you don't need Derek Barnett to be a double-digit sack guy to be an impactful player. We need someone to step up and be the sack guy. We know it's not going to be BG, so who is it going to be? Our defensive end well, is that's still not fair because in 2016, BG led the NFL in quarterback hurries. What did that be? Yeah, but he's not a he's not a sack guy. See, sack is an overrated stat. I disagree. No, I, I disagree with you because here's why. How many times do you see a quarterback make a bad throw or make a bad play and he wasn't sacked? Well, yeah, there's value in that, but sacks the are also important. Pressuring the quarterback has more value than the actual sack. Because how many times do a guy get a sack because he fell into it? They're both be, valuable. They're both valuable. I th I think you're over. There's guys the sack. that are really good at sacking the quarterback, and there's guys that are very good at two of the last the three years. Brandon Graham has been one of the pass rush, best pass rushers in the NFL because he's constantly getting hurries. Now, he's constantly getting the quarterback off his spot. Imagine packaging that up with someone who can do who can sack very well. Now you're really in. in Making teams in trouble. But Derek Barnett showed you before the injury that he is more than capable of being that guy. Right, you're taking a risk that he will be able to duplicate that. You're Just like you it. would take the risk by getting Clowney that he will be able to make the scheme switch. I would rather not take the risk on Clowney. And then, what, what are we going to hear if it doesn't work out in December? How he shouldn't have made this deal. What the heck is wrong with the Eagles? Well, what would happen if Clowney ends up being a dog anywhere else he goes, and we'd say, why didn't Howie make that deal if Nelson Aguilar can't catch a football again? Yeah, but this Aguilar, is, thing. Aguilar Ag is over the catching issues. Do we know that? Yeah. Do we? He was fine the last two years. He was fine the Super Bowl year. And last year was fine, too. But this is the this is the point I'm trying to make is Nelson Aguilar, if that is the, the guy who ends up being traded for this, and, and yeah. I do think it's a long shot, but I also think that there's a, a somewhat of a chance that it actually happens. Yeah. You're talking about your third or fourth wide receiver, which you have J.J. Arthega Whiteside there to replace, and you can bring in someone who would be more impactful at his position than Nelson Aguilar would be in the slot. With what we have with Alshon, Zach Ertz, Dallas Goddard, Deshaun, I think J uh, Jadavion Clowney would be able to bring in a different Look, yeah, I'm not. I'm look. not denying that he could have an impact on the team. I just don't think it's as. I I think it's more Madden football value than it is real world value. So you're all about the video game th comparisons here. Why why is that a Madden thing? That's a real thing. It's because, a real life because thing. In, because in Madden you can change a guy's stats and numbers and make him fit whatever team you want him to. Whereas in real life. You know, if, if Clowney can't get off the line with his hand in the dirt very well, or if he has trouble adapting to the scheme or anything, people are going to be angry and frustrated. But that's any player whenever you make any type of trade. If you make a trade, it's for someone coming from, who knows, I'm just spitballing, Minnesota, or yeah. which would never happen. But, you know, I mean, any other team, whatever the case <laughs> may be. Maybe it will. Hey, Sam Bradford trade worked out. You end up making the trades... And you need to take a wild hope that he will be beneficial when you make that trade. And I don't think there would be there would be some sort of film study with Clowney in the past. Okay, can he come off the line? They wouldn't do this blind. Oh, let's take a wild shot at it. There would be some research involved on if he would be able to fit this before we made the move. 
609-403-0973. He's Hunter Brody. I'm Josh Hennig. We'll take more of your text messages coming up next. Again, football at 4 coming up with John McMullen at 4 o'clock. Well, Gary Myers. Myers. NFL Network does their NFL Network players, right? Player rankings. The players vote for the NFL 100. But these aren't players. These are guys who cover these teams day in and day out. So I think that these rankings will probably reflect those reporters' biases. Yeah, I was going to say, what do you think has more credibility to it? Do neither. People, really? You neither. think neither? I think that if you want a real 100 list, you should take this ESPN list, combine it with the players' list, and get another list. Who would vote that, though? The fans? No. All the executives in the NFL. Would that change anything, though? I think it would. What would it change? Because I think that when you and I read this list, we're going to criticize some of these rankings. And it's going to be because I think that if you're an NFL executive, you're not going to value certain players over others. Because the problem is with a lot of these lists, you have people's biases that come in the conversation. And at the end of the day, you can't fully get rid of a bias. You know, if you cover... If you're John McMullen, okay, we just talked to, and you see Lane Johnson every day, John speaks every year about how impressive Lane Johnson is, right? But he also sees him every day. Whereas if you don't see a certain player every day, your opinion may be different about them. That's a good point, but I believe that there's too many positions in football that have a true 100 list. Because how do you value an outside linebacker compared to a tight end, compared to a wide receiver, compared to a safety, compared to a cornerback? How do you value that as a whole? It's similar to the conversation of when you talk about the best basketball player ever. It's almost as if you have to take the centers out because it's a different position to a small forward or to a point guard. I think specifically using the word value, the value changes from team to team. Like you heard John say that in the NFL in general, the running back is a devalued position. Except for the Cowboys, that he is how their offense is built around. So for the Cowboys and for the Giants with Saquon Barkley, they may be ridiculously valuable, but compared to other teams, you know, Jordan Howard is nowhere as valuable to the Eagles as Zeke is to the Cowboys. I think the value differs from team to team. For example, number one on the list is Aaron Donald. Number two is Pat Mahomes. To me, it's a no-brainer that Pat Mahomes is is way like more valuable than Aaron Donald is. And I know how great Aaron Donald is. He is a beast. He's unstoppable. But I'm sorry, the quarterback is so much more important to me than a defensive tackle. Right, and that and that comes down to your your value system. You know, Aaron Donald, most people believe, is the best defensive player in the NFL. And you could argue that the Rams' defense is nothing without him. So, if Patrick Mahomes is the MVP of the NFL, as he was last year, and Aaron Donald is arguably the defensive MVP of the NFL, it's almost like a 1A, 1B kind of scenario than anything else, because it really depends on, are you declaring one's value based on a specific position or how they are to their team? I think that if you took Pat Mahomes off the Chiefs... You just stole where I was going here. Go ahead, finish okay, your point. Well, <laughs> I'm glad we're going down the same road. If you take Pat Mahomes off the Chiefs, you know, let's say let's say both teams are 13-3. and three. I'm going to make the playing even playing field because I don't want to get into what their records were last year and blah, blah, blah. You know, and let's be realistic. The Chiefs could have been the Super Bowl last year. It's not like they got blown up by the Patriots in the AFC Championship game. They were to step away from the, the Super Bowl. So both teams are pretty close to each other. How many more wins is Pat Mahomes getting you on the Chiefs versus Aaron Donald or the Rams? A lot. You can take Aaron give, Donald out. Give me a number. Well, I mean, I can't just like say a number. I mean, there, there's two different positions. If if Aaron Donald wasn't on the defensive line for the Rams and they had the same exact team, but you enter a serviceable defensive tackle, I'm just spit on here and just say Sue is there. And, and I know he was there last year, but whatever. Sue is in there. Another Sue. You got two of them. <laughs> Your team can still make the Super Bowl constructed like last year. The Chiefs would not be in the AFC Championship game if Pat Mahomes was not their quarterback last year. The drop-off is way bigger if you change the quarterback of the Chiefs. 
You understand what I'm saying? Like, for example, five is DeAndre Hopkins. Great wide receiver. Six is Aaron Rodgers. Nine is Russell Wilson. The quarterback means so much more than these other players. So the list just makes no sense to me. Is that crazy to think? I'm not discounting what you're saying, but here's here's the problem. You don't value quarterbacks as much as I do, though. No, I don't, because I think that we overlook, like, look at Andrew Luck. You know why he retired? Because he got beat up. Why did he get beat up? Yeah, I, I get it. Their offensive Answer the question. Their offensive line wasn't right, great. So if Pat Mahomes' offensive line wasn't blocking for him last year, he probably throws t- at least 10 less touchdowns. Yeah, I'm not. My point isn't it's not a team game, but it, it's it's obnoxious to think the quarterback isn't way more valuable Again, than any other position. Ah, but what did I say an hour ago? I said that we all agree that the most important position is quarterback. See, I'm not denying that the quarterback isn't valuable. I'm just saying that the gap between the quarterback and the next position isn't as big, in my opinion, as you feel. What's the next position? Because it would be offensive line to me. It would be left tackle. I would say it, it's it depending on the team. It's a toss up between the offensive line and a defensive pass rusher. Because to me, if if quarterback's number one, okay, we both agree on that, right? I think anybody listening to us in their right mind believes as well that the quarterback is the most important position on the football field because they touch the ball every play of the game. When their offense is on the field, who's touching the ball? The quarterback in the center. It's not the running back, it's not the wide receiver. So we both agree on that. But I think after quarterback, the the priority is offensive line, defensive line, and then everything else after that is kind of like just depending on who the player is. Like, I'm I'm under the belief that unless you are an elite player in the NFL, like a lot, if you're among the best of the best, most players are interchangeable in the NFL. Unless you're like Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers kind of level, most of the quarterbacks can be swapped for each other and you're getting similar results, okay? Unless your name is Odell Beckham Jr., okay, and DeAndre Hopkins, most of the wide receivers in the NFL are, are interchangeable. Where so, would you put Alshon Jeffrey in that list? I think I, I don't think Alshon is an elite receiver. I think he's very good, but I don't think he's among the five 10 best in the NFL. I think he's right outside the top 10, but I don't think he's top 10. Yeah, he's not elite, but he's in the category of, of above average. I, I would say very good. Is very good above average? Or better than that? I think it's better than above average. Okay, I agree, with, I agree with you then. Yeah, but can you, inter- can you take him out and throw someone else in? You're saying, would Alshon Jeffrey being above average, would that be interchangeable? Yeah, because if you swapped him with... A similar skilled receiver, like, I'm, I'm just throwing out a name, Jarvis Landry, okay? Or Juju Smith-Schuster, or um, Adam Thielen, okay? It's not like the Eagles' production at that position goes exponentially down. Okay. Like, there's not that much of a change, right? The Eagles' offense is still going to do what it does. Yeah, you're cha- you're changing, though, so you're changing an above-average receiver with an above-average receiver. In right. that regards, yes, there wouldn't be much of a drop. And that's why I'm saying, like, to me, part of the problem with these lists is that some of these guys are interchangeable. Like, But the quarterback isn't. Uh, Dak Prescott on the Eagles, two different teams than with Carson Wentz. Well, I don't, I don't think Dak and Carson Wentz are similar interchangeable talents. So who would you change Carson Wentz with that wasn't, that wasn't Tom Brady, Phillip Rivers, you know, those type of quarterbacks at the top of the league, Drew Brees? Who would you change Carson Wentz with to the point where we have a similar record with Wentz. Roethlisberger? You hate Roethlisberger. No, no, I don't hate Roethlisberger. I just think it's funny that that dude is literally one offseason away from being the Pillsbury Doughboy. I think it's funny. What does that mean, though? Like, he looks like he's an offseason and not exercising away from being hefty. But he's able to contribute. No, he's still a good quarterback. He's I don't. I don't like. Is there another one? Because I don't know if I like Big Ben. Just because okay. the age thing, it, it okay, makes you don't it. Like the age I, thing. I don't. I don't. All right. How about like Mitch Trubisky? No. Okay. I, I'm just seeing where your head's at because I think the quarterback you can't just change the that changes everything. But I me. think that there are certain quarterbacks who you can. Okay, so maybe it's not among. Just get away from the top five quarterbacks. Like I think if you put. Okay. How about this? 
if you interchanged Carson Wentz and Matt Ryan, that's a perfect example. Okay, I think Matt Stafford, e- maybe. I think Matt Ryan's a better guy, but I think Matt Ryan is closer to Carson Wentz than not. So the, this argument kind of is similar to this. If if you swap above average wide receiver with an above average wide receiver, you're not missing a step. Correct. If you switch a above average quarterback with an above average quarterback, you're not missing a step. Right. Okay. Well, then I mean that's that's and that's why I don't like saying somebody's list because one of the guys in the top ten on this list is Julio Jones at seven. Julio Jones's team has a losing record when he has six or more catches in a game. But I don't think that's his fault. No, it's not, but it's an example of how ineffective his team is when he has some of these big games. It's not his fault. I think if he was on a different team, it'd be a different situation. But when they're down, when the Falcons are losing a game, they start feeding him to the detriment of the offense. That's not his fault. That's the offense coordinator. That's the quarterback. That's the team's fault. But the problem is, is that because of that, it devalues him a little bit. I think that if you're... If you're giving me that top 10 list, I would never, ever, ever put Julio Jones on the top list because, to me, there's only one wide receiver in the NFL that should be on the top 10 list. Who's that? The only man in the NFL... (laughs) It sounded like somebody else for a minute. The only guy in the NFL who had zero drops last year and had over 100 targets. DeAndre Hopkins. The dude doesn't drop the ball. The dude all just gets catches... Yards and touchdowns. He's incredible. Everybody else in the NFL drops the ball. See, I think Antonio Brown is a better player. I think there's things like attitude and and some off the field stuff that plays a factor into okay. it. But w- skill set wise, I believe Antonio Brown is better than DeAndre Hopkins. See, I disagree. I think Hopkins is a better athlete. I think he's got the better hands. I think that Antonio better the, hands. Like, aren't they almost the same? You can't. I just told you he's the only guy who had no drops last year. But is that because of where the throw? Like, if, if Antonio Brown gets his hands on a play because he's so talented that no other receiver would even have a chance for, but it was a ball that wasn't thrown perfectly, what is that makes, his fault for dropping it? What makes Antonio Brown a great receiver is his route running. In my opinion, he is the best route runner in the NFL. His route running ability makes up for any deficiency in his game. I don't think you can tell me that someone's hands are better than Antonio Brown's. You can tell me they're the same, but better? At what point can it get better? I think it's zero drops is better. But that that there's other things to actually process when the zero drops conversation comes up. That's in. why like, I said guys who were targeted over 100 times last year. I specifically made a delineation because that, that eliminates all of the you know dudes who only got 30 targets and then 30 catches kind of people. Like I'm specifically talking about the dudes you get over 100 targets. The, the Zach Ertz, Julio Jones, Antonio Brown, the Andre Hopkins, OBJ... Uh, Travis Kelsey dudes. like Those dudes are getting a crazy amount of throws to them. Yeah, but tight ends isn't the same as a wide receiver. So if Antonio Brown makes up for a bad throw where he almost catches it, but no other receiver would even make it close, and it ends up being dropped just because of his fingertips, but he's so elite that he made it reasonable, that doesn't mean that his hands are bad. How do you know that DeAndre Hopkins can't make the same catch? He can. That's My point is that they're the same. I can't say DeAndre Hopkins has better hands than Antonio Brown. Because at some point, your hands are, can max out. And I think these players have maxed out hands. They're not, you want to go, you want to go They've Madden? Maxed out of you, hands. You want to go Madden? We'll go Madden. They're 99 overall in hands. So you can't get any higher than Antonio that. Antonio Brown's a 98. No. DeAndre Hopkins is 99. Yeah, not when I go in and change it. I'm, I'm the, I'm the Madden grader over here. <laughs> no, I'm just yeah, the guy who doesn't even play. <laughs> I, well, I haven't played in four or five years. We got a text. Someone asked. Kirk Cousins. You swap Kirk Cousins for Wentz. This is Anthony in Egg Harbor Township. So I think you're taking a definite step down. That's what he asked. Are we missing a step? You are missing a step, Anthony. Here's why. Kirk Cousins. So here's how it works out. And I explained this on my podcast last year, which you can check out at 97.3 ESPN.com. Kirk Cousins is not a hybrid quarterback. See, Carson Wentz can throw anticipation throws and see it and throw it, guys. Kirk Cousins is not a very good anticipation thrower. He is more of a see-it-and-throw-it guy. And the problem with see-it-and-throw-it is that that tends for you to have to wait for a play to draw out in order for you to make the throw. Carson Wentz's ability to anticipate 
Alshon Jeffrey, Zach Ertz being places makes them better players. Kirk Cousins cannot do that level of anticipation that Carson Wentz can, and that leads to some of Kirk Cousins' interceptions. Now, if you want to criticize Wentz for not throwing interceptions sometimes, yeah, he's a little afraid to throw the trigger, but I'd rather have the guy not turn the ball over than turn the ball over. Texture says, I'm going to be bouncing all over tomorrow night. Eagles on the cell phone. Okay, he's just going to have the, the phone stream. College football on the TV going back and forth with Big Brother for my fiance. I'm pumped. Ooh, is that a little bit of sarcasm at the end, or do you think he's really pumped about Big Brother? I mean, it could be. I don't know. I'm not sure. The way I, he said that, it made it seem like he was disappointed in having to switch back and like forth. Like, he, he doesn't have an exclamation point. There's no period after that. There's no dots. Like, he just left it open-ended on, on pump. See, no, I would rather have, as much as I disagree with not having football on the big screen, that needs to be the big thing. But if Big Brother is on the big screen, I can't do the switch back and forth. I'd rather have, like, you have the phone stream, then you have the laptop stream, so the football game's always up. Because you can't miss a big play. What happens when you turn the channel and, oh my god, 14 points! What happened? Yeah, I, I think if I were him, I would, I would put the college... If you're intent on watching Big Brother, okay, and if that's part of the plan, you, you either got to have the football on the big screen or the small screen. Yes, you know, I agree. Full time. No full time. Flip, no flippage. If you want to flip, flip with the Eagles. Correct. You, you know, nailed cause, it. Because at the end of the day, if you miss a, a touchdown run by... Wendell Smallwood? <laughs> Is he if he's even going to be in the game? I don't know. Josh Adams. Josh Where are we Adams, going here? Right. Okay, Josh Adams. You know, if you know, you can see a replay of that. Yeah, like you'll that, see it on Twitter in three minutes. Right, or or you'll get an alert on your phone. Be like, did you see this catch by Jr. I think a white side. You know, I get those alerts sometimes. Like, I'll be watching the game. I looked at my phone. It's like, did you see this catch? And I'm like, yeah, I, yeah. I just saw it. That's bro. why I subscribe to you because I'm a diehard <laughs> fan. So yes, yes, I did see the play. <laughs> so my suggestion for this guy is like you said. Leave either Big Brother on the big screen if you have to watch it with the fiance. The small screen for your favorite college football game so you don't miss anything. The Eagles preseason game could be on the flip. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the same page as you. You nailed it. You're a smart man, Josh. That's why I got to start listening to you when it comes That's to betting. On the text board, it says that they're not watching the Eagles preseason game. They'd rather watch replays of MMA fights. We have one person that's going to flip the Phillies and Big Brother in college football. It's a, it's a lot going on right there, a lot of moving parts. Give him credit. I mean, I, I I can't judge the guy. I got tons of moving parts sometimes too. I got, I mean, I'll sometimes have a, you know three screens going and then have another game on the radio. Like, now, I want to bring this point up to you because I get yelled at at home for this. Okay, I need to sit on the couch and eat, but I I I, I have the the table. You know the the table you can bring over the fold out table that you can sit sure down, the TV yeah. dinner table. I guess you would say. Okay, I need to sit in front of the TV and eat if the Phillies are on. But I always get yelled at. Eat it at the table. My back is turned to the TV. I can't see it. What is your approach to eating dinner, eating food while watching the game right in front of you? I, I need to see it. So, well, first of all, the text board is 609-403-0973. If someone wants to chime in on this. So, now, I will preface this as I am a single guy. You have a girlfriend, okay? You are in a long-term relationship, okay? So, it's a little different for you. Also... When I was growing up, my parents gave up very early on the whole come to the table and eat thing. Say with me at my you know, house. My my parents were very like, look, we're gonna put the TV near the the TV near the kitchen table so you can watch your sports or whatever you're watching while you're eating. My parents gave up very early on. That's so, great parenting. Josh. So I, I I haven't legitimately sat at a table to eat outside of like a handful of like holidays. When there wasn't anything on TV, I mean, wow. What? Like, for example, if I go I'm get... legitimately trying to think of the last time I sat down at a table for dinner. Well, we have the island in the kitchen, so I'll we give sit it to you really at quick. the island. The last time I sat down for dinner, ever, was the once-of-year holiday parties we have here at Town Square Media. Like... When, when the station, like me, Gil, Pete Thompson, the whole building goes out for the Christmas party, that's when we sit down for dinner. 
So then you'll eat out on the couch. So you're you're backing up and supporting my thought process of you should you should eat dinner on the couch or you couch, can watch the game. Chair, bed, floor. Uh, well, bed, bed and, oh, no, bed and floor, huh? Whatever. You can't lay down in bed and eat. You gotta go couch. You get your little TV Look, stand man, that folds out. Wherever the TV is and there's food nearby, I'm I'm going. And and I respect that. But to me, it's the sports. I mean, come on, man. You haven't lived if you haven't been drinking in bed and watching a game <laughs> at like 12 o'clock at night waiting for your parlay to, to, to <laughs> come to, to hit fruition. on a West Coast game? Come yeah. on. Well, I'm, I'm watching Hawaii versus Arizona last week. Waiting for them to hit the over. They finally hit the over at 1 a.m. in the morning. I'm thinking more. This is my mindset on, on this. It's I go pick up Chipotle. It's around 7 o'clock. The Phillies are about those to Those don't know. 100 obsessed with Chipotle. Well, of course. It's the greatest thing on earth. So the, the Phillies pitch Chipotle is Chipotle seven- over Popeyes and Chick-fil-A. And- yeah, 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 no doubt. 705 is <laughs> the first pitch for Aaron Nola. I get back at the house at 702, all right? I'm not going to sit at the island with my back turned against the TV so I can't see anything. It's so simple. You eat on the couch. Oh, I get frustrated because i got to put up a fight, Josh. That's why I'm all heated up over here. i got to put up a fight every time. No deadline for Zeke, and they just won him for the playoffs. Yeah, it's insane. I mean, it's just insane. This guy has no clue on how to to keep everything right. But is he? Does he have a clue? Is is it reverse psychology? No. Don't give him too much credit here. Look, I I am a Jerry Jones hater. Okay, I've been very anti Jones. I don't, I don't like the fact that he got in the Hall of Fame for Pat Bolin. I think Jerry Jones is a little egotistical. I think that Jerry is a me first. You know, I'm going to stand out in front kind of guy. But I think in this Zeke situation, he's in the right. Because you won't, you only have so much salary cap room to go around, and, and Zeke wants to be paid more than Todd Gurley, and Dak wants to get paid more than Wentz, and Amari Cooper wants to get paid Julio Jones money. There's only so much money to go around, and I think that Jerry, he's standing his ground. He's saying, "Look, I'm going to pay all of you, but you got to work with me." Like he paid Jalen Smith. Yeah, but I don't think that's the message he's sending out, though. He's not sending out, you got to work with me in this friendly matter. I think it's more of a, hey, you were doing this on my terms. Well, it should be his terms. It's his money. Sure, but that's not how it works with the NFL when these guys can hold out and hold all of these people hostage. But the the NFL is is not a player's league. We all know that. The play is not like the NBA. The NBA is run by the players. In the in the NFL. It's about the name on the front of the jersey, not the name on the back of the jersey. And that's the problem for these guys. Look at Le'Veon Bell. He ended up with less money because he held out. You know, you look at some of these other but guys who hold out. I think that's based off position because the running back just isn't valued. Well, what does he play? Running back. And that's I've been saying it from the jump that they should trade him and get a bunch of assets. That's how I would build this team. You, you pay Dak. You pay Amari Cooper. You go out and do your linebacker thing. And you, you trade Zeke away. I know he's really important to the offense, but you get a ton of assets and you start from there. That's how I would have approached this situation. I hear you. But I think Jerry also, Jerry is very aware of the history of the Cowboys. This, is a, this could be the third iteration of the triplets. Remember you had Aikman, Smith. Michael Irvin in the 90s. In the 1970s, you had Roger Staubach, Drew Pearson, and Hall of Famer Tony Dorsett. So three different times now you've had a big quarterback, running back, wide receiver. I think Jerry wants to keep with that and not sacrifice it. The problem is that I don't think that these players understand that you got to give a little to get something. And I don't think that – I don't know who's fully at fault. I don't know if it's Zeke. I don't know if it's agent. I'm inclined to think it's his agent. You know, I think that the report that the Cowboys are willing to give Zeke number two running back money, like just under Todd Gurley money, if I'm Zeke, I, I should just take it. Because if you can get the guaranteed money in the NFL, dude, you don't know how long your career is going to be. What what if, what if tomorrow he like trips on a on a on a, a brick and and Cabo and like rips his leg open? Well, like, that's why I think he's holding out. Because he knows he doesn't know how long his career is going to be. So why not try and get the most of his money now? Yeah, but here's the thing. If you are already going to be guaranteed, let's say, $50, $60 million, are you really holding out for $10 million Yes, I, we've had this discussion before. To us, the common people, that's, you know, oh, of course, 50 mil. But when you are a professional athlete that can make 60, $10 million is a lot of money. But here's for the thing. To, to can he for. make 60 to 70? They or, think so. Or, or is it that his agent? is trying to get him to only push for that. Well, that's their job, to make them the most money. Yeah, but in this case, does the agent have Ezekiel Elliott's best interests? 
Or is he just trying to get his, the biggest cut of his he can? But isn't that the point of their job? Like, for example, look at James, uh, uh, Jadavian Clowney. We'll get into more Clowney a little bit later. But he fired his agent this week. Bus Cook is one of the biggest name agents in the business. And he fired him because he said, this guy is not getting me on the field. This guy is not getting me a contract. He stalemated with the Texans, and now I have a bad relationship with the organization that drafted me because my agent didn't serve me. Yeah, but the Houston Texans don't even have a GM. So I think the Houston Texans are a joke internally to begin with. Well, to technically the, point the where, Cowboys don't have a GM either. Yeah, but there's a difference between where Jerry Jones is and where the Houston Texans are when it comes to sure. who, who's running it and I'm, what's I'm the just, style. I'm just saying that there's something to be said for you have a player who literally just said, my agent is failing me. I'm getting rid of him. Yeah, that happens. And it's not the only one. There's been several guys in the NFL over the last several months who have fired their agents and got new agents. Look at all the guys who have signed on with CAA and the Jay-Zs of the world. And, you know, Drew Rosenhaus is picking up new clients left and right because these guys are realizing my agent doesn't have my best interest in mind. And I got to wonder with Zeke, he needs to look at his agent the way way Jadavian looked at his agent and say, I don't care who you are, dude. Like, are you really have my best interest at heart? Because at some point... The agent has to inform the player and say, look, here is how much money the Cowboys have. Here is much money is in their bank account. Here is how much is under the cap. Here is what that can happen. Like, yeah, bring me a flow chart. Bring me a breakdown. Bring me a something. I don't know if this guy is giving Zeke good advice. Like, you look at the Eagles. I don't think Howie Roseman signs all these dudes just because Howie's a smart guy. Like, I'm not saying he isn't. But I think there's something else to it. I think Howie explains to the agent what he's doing. I think Howie and his people detail to them what the plan is. Like when they signed Carson Wentz that money, I think it was them sitting Carson down and say, here's our position, here's our financial situation, here's what we can do for you. Yeah, but that's because we have a good organization that's ran correctly. I don't think the Cowboys are ran correctly. They're better ran than the Houston Texans, but they're not ran in the most perfect way. Sure, but I don't. I don't think you get the Jalen Smith deal done if if Jerry Jones is totally inept of running an organization. No, he's he's not inept. But I, I just think you're valuing. You need to realize that these players, at the end of the day, most of them they don't care about the structure of the team and who's getting what contract. They just worry about themselves. So if Zeke is sitting there knowing he's the best running back in the league. If he can get 60 instead of 50, he's going to hold out for that. I don't think it's the agent trying to make an extra 10. I believe Zeke believes he deserves the extra 10 as well. It's not just the agent trying to make the money. Yeah, but you can believe you can get that extra money, but is someone willing to pay you that money? Well, that's why they're fighting for it. That's sure. the that's the fight. But you mentioned the Dallas Cowboys and looking back at their tradition and looking at the three guys they had on their team to make a run. Right. Well, they did also make a big trade before with Walker, which was a big time splash, and that helped out their organization as a whole. Sure. So if you do look back in history, maybe Jerry Jones remembers that big trade. And and that's a good pull by you, but the exception for that is part of the reason why the Cowboys traded Herschel is because they had no assets. And Jimmy Johnson wanted to get assets. And let's be realistic. Herschel wasn't prime Herschel anymore. Correct. You know, I think trading's... First of all, you'll never see that haul again. <laughs> I mean, because we've seen what happened to teams like, you know, the Ricky Williams trade almost 20 years ago now, uh, where the Saints gave up everything for Ricky Williams and Mike Dicker got fired. <laughs> so, um, but I do think, yes, you're right. You can get a substantial return for Zeke. I don't think the Cowboys want to trade him, though. I think the Cowboys want him there, and I don't think Zeke wants to be traded. I think Zeke feels like he wants to be a Cowboy. He said in the Maxim article that, I want to be a Cowboy. I want to spend my whole career here. But I think there's a part of it to sit down and realize, look, we can pay you in other ways that are not average annual salary. Okay? That AAV everyone talks about. Average annual value, right? I think you can pay a guy beyond that number without it going... Like, for example, Carson Wentz, his average annual value of his salary is not even top five. It's barely top ten in the league. But he has more guaranteed money than anybody else right now, as long as he's on the roster next year. So there are ways you can manipulate the numbers and tell Zeke, look, 
we got to keep your cap number at XYZ, but we're willing to front you this money up front for guaranteed money. Like, you can maneuver the money. I don't know if Zeke is informed enough by his agent or if he's just pushing for, I want to be the highest paid running back per year where the Cowboys are turning around and saying, look, we're going to give you the money, but your annual value is not going to be on the level of Todd Gurley. Yeah, so you're going, you're attacking the agent here, and it's interesting because I haven't really heard that take too much. I don't know if it really is the agent, though. You you look at, around at the Cowboys. Are the Cowboys known for for maneuvering money the way Howie Roseman is? I just don't think that's the way the organization works. They don't have a history of doing contracts the way you're speaking of when it comes to you know their team building. So the the specific contract that I'm thinking of with the Cowboys was several years ago when they signed Des Bryant to that big contract. But at the same time, they were paying Tony Romo huge money. But what did they do? Because of the history with Des off the field. Remember, when Des first came to the NFL, he was a bit of a trouble child. And so what they do? They gave him a babysitter. They basically they hired a guy that drove Des everywhere. And he never got in trouble ever again. They literally gave him like a built-in friend <laughs> who was employed by the Cowboys. And the guy drove him everywhere, helped him with his schedule. He never had problems ever again. But they told Des, like, look, you do have a bit of a history off the field. Zeke does too, by the way. Why not go to them and be like, look, we're going to format this contract. We're going to get you paid. But we got to pay you a certain number on the cap so we can pay other people too. I think Zeke is overlooking the fact that Jerry Jones has gone to the wall for him. You know, when it came to them trying to appeal Zeke's suspension, that might not come out of Zeke's agent's pocket or Zeke's pocket or Zeke's lawyers. The Cowboys paid their own lawyers to fight for Zeke to get out of that suspension. A suspension that we now find out that he really should never have been suspended for. Let's be realistic. Roger Goodell just decides one day to suspend people, basically. Yeah, but do you think that's because Jerry, Jerry Jones believes... Is he really fighting for Zeke in that spot, or was he fighting for the Dallas Cowboys to win more Both, football games? because he knows that they, in order for them to win football games, he needs Zeke. Right. Well, I, I don't know. I think the miscommunication between the two was just the fact that this is standard. Like, this isn't out of the ordinary. This is what sports are now. One player believes they're worth X amount. The owner doesn't believe he's worth X amount. And then they they fight to see who, who ends up winning, essentially. This is common in sports. It's not anything out of the ordinary. This is just what sports are these days. How do we get sidetracked into the Dallas Cowboys for the first 15 minutes? <laughs> well, I brought up Gary Myers coming no, I up at, at 5.30. <laughs> By the <laughs> way, text board is open at 609-403-0973. 609-403-0973. We do have a lot of football to talk about. And we're not going about the Flyers, which is the shirt you're wearing today. But... We are going to talk about the Phillies. There is some Flyers talk, actually. Uh, Real, no, no, no. Time out. It's a, it's a, it's a show please. similar to Hard Knocks. The Flyers are on it. it starts late September. That's all I got for you. Seriously, I'm not kidding. There, so there's a, there's an NHL version of Hard Knocks. Yeah, for training camp. The Flyers were chosen. What channel is this on? Oh, uh, that's a good question. I will find that out. Well, how about you do that research and while we talk about the Phillies? Okay, I'm okay. in. So you you get me that information, and I'm glad to talk about it because I well, like. No, hard knocks. there's nothing to talk about. It's just something. Well, to throw I mean, out it's there. interesting. I mean, I like hard knocks. I'm a fan of hard knocks. Yeah, I'm, so I'm not. in with hard knocks. So if the Flyers are on an NHL version of hard knocks, is not on some network that I never heard of that I can't find. NHL on NHL Network. Okay, I have that channel. Okay, it's on NHL Network Wednesday, September 25th. So how about it? So is this like an episodic thing, or is this like a one a one shot? Documentary. No, I I believe it's a it's a weekly thing. Okay, so I, it's a little like hard knocks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're going to be at Flyers training camp. Yes, they're going to follow them around. Correct. Behind the glass, Philadelphia Flyers training camp is set to premiere Wednesday, September twenty fifth, eight o'clock, NHL Network. All right. So your job now is to set yourself a reminder for that, and remind me when we get closer. Okay, I can so do when, that. So when you are in with me on Saturdays, we can talk about this. I'm in because. I'm all for the behind-the-scenes look. I'm a huge fan. And if Text in 609-403-0973. One of the things I love about Hard Knocks is the behind-the-scenes access. The meetings, the talk on the sideline. I know some of it is contrived a bit because they know they're on camera. But you can tell the, the parts that are not. You can tell this moment was real. Like This moment was raw. This moment was legitimate. And you can tell the moments that are not. And I think that... 
you always want to see the behind the scenes. Let's be realistic. There's never been a hard knocks for the Eagles. And there never will be because you have to be bad. Uh, that's part of it. But also part of it is apparently uh, there was a report a few years ago. The Eagles are one of the ownerships that told the NFL they want nothing to do with it. Which is surprising because Jeffrey Lurie has a Hollywood background. Yeah, he, it is weird. Like, I don't like the argument of, well, people are going to steal stuff from it. Because that's just absurd. Yeah, in in what way. world are you going to watch anything that we've seen so far in Hard Knocks and use it against the Raiders in a regular season game? If you really think that there was something on Hard Knocks that you're going to use against the Raiders in a regular season, you're nuts. Right, but that's some of the arguments. And, and it's not just that. It's the same with open camp that we talk about with yeah. the Eagles, too. It's someone's going to steal well, the stuff. John McMullen has talked about this before. You know, the Eagles are make a big deal, and maybe too much of a big deal, about not conveying certain information. And that's why, for example, like, so Deshaun Jackson broke his ring finger on his left hand. He'll be fine. He's going to start the season, okay? But the problem isn't that. The problem is, what did John say on the air yesterday? On Football 4, he says, that was the part of practice that we weren't allowed to see. We only knew he broke his finger because when we got in the locker room and talked to the players, there he was with his finger Wrapped up. Well, what was there to see, though? What what could you possibly see? I'm confused. Well, I mean, you might see the play that it happened. Oh, so they weren't able to even see what happened? Correct. Okay. That's what I mean. So they were just there asking questions after practice? They found out after practice, did the media. Gotcha. That Deshaun broke his ring finger on his left hand. and But he's going to be fine. Wide receivers break fingers all the time. It's not that big a deal. Yeah, he has this special splint for it. Apparently, that is used around the league to yeah. the point where they don't even realize your finger's broken. Isn't that wild to think about, though? Like, I, I remember Anquan Bolden broke one of his fingers years ago, and the next game he had like 10 catches in the game or something like that. Like, it, it doesn't, in the big picture, it doesn't really affect anything. But what I do think is interesting is that the Eagles are so dead set upon not letting people see certain things. And I just, I don't believe that, I understand that when you're installing an offense, you don't want to put too much out there, but at the same time, like, you're telling me that you're going to keep everything a secret, like, at some point, you got to have a little extra transparency, like, you know, this isn't the CIA with espionage here. Like, it's not like we're like stealing nuclear secrets or something, like, it's football. There's only so many variations you can do on the same play, like, there's only so many variations you can do on 12 personnel, which is two tight end, two wide receiver, one running back, and a quarterback. Like, how many ways can you really vary up that offense? Well, there's, I think that there's a lot, no? I think there's more than you're saying. That's the beauty of it. No, I don't think so. But because, that's what makes it not important. Because if you have, if there's so many different plays you can run off a 12 personnel set, well, yeah. if we line up in 12 personnel, because we've done it before in an open practice, you don't know what's coming because there's so many different ways you can run it. Sure, but at the same time, if you're running 12 personnel, you can you can shift out of that set into something totally else, and it won't even matter. Like, you can you can line up in any formation you want, and then the quarterback can change the whole formation on one call. Like, I just, I don't think that th this whole, like, you know, th the Eagles being vague and coy at times about things that are going on. Like, like remember the whole thing with Carson Wentz last year? Oh, we don't know if Carson's playing yet. The whole ward is reporting that he's going to play week three last year, remember? Doug's just, well, you know, Carson hasn't practiced yet. They even did that this year a little bit with the preseason games. Yeah. Every, all the starters are up uh, in in the beginning of the game throwing reps in pregame warm-ups and, yep. oh, is Carson going to play? And then you see Clayton Thorson run out of the tunnel first. Well, I guess Carson's not playing. And then Clayton didn't start. Yeah. It's Cody Kessler. Yeah, I don't know why they do this. Why are they so scared to inform the public anything that's going on? Doug Doug Peterson calls it gamesmanship. I. I'm not fully sure if it's gamesmanship as much as it is just, you know... Overthinking? Overthinking, yeah. yeah. big time. Again, 609-403-0973 is the text board. We're all over the place today right now. He's Hunter Brody. I'm Josh Henning. Let's save the Phillies talk for after the break. Okay, we can we, do that. We do have to talk some Phillies <laughs> because... That's great. Last night's game had a, a few different things that stood out to me, at least. And, of course, if you didn't know, Hunter Brody is the man giving you the Phillies reactions every day after the Phillies games at 97.3 ESPN.com. His daily Phillies after-game reactions. 
Now, are you going to do these reactions as well for the other sports too? Yeah, I do that on on. I don't know the the deal yet. I have to talk to Gil about what we're going to do for the website. Okay. But on the personal YouTube channel, I do it for all four squads. Okay, so so there's hope that you you'll be doing this for everything. Yes. Okay. We, we just got to game plan it. Okay. Well, I was curious because I'm looking forward to when the Sixers or the Flyers lose a game because for me, I'm just the Phillies have gone sour for me a little bit. Like it's just getting old. Like I I see it. It's I, the same conversation right. almost it's, every time. Like how many times can we talk about the pitching didn't do their job? Somebody struck out. Somebody messed up. Um, but there were some things last night that are to talk about, like the Sean Rodriguez stuff, and um, you know the whole Drew Smiley situation of, you know, did he did he really lose the game? Was a reset lost the game? You know, we talk about that. But before we get to that, j- just finishing up with the Eagles. I just think that when when you have a guy like Deshaun Jackson, someone as high of a name as he is, like we're not talking about, um, I don't know, well, Shelton Gibson. Shelton Gibson has been cut, so uh, we're not talking about Greg Ward here, right? We're not talking about um, uh, who who's the one guy from Rutgers, um, Agadosi. Oh, Agadosi. Yeah, yeah, he's like six seven, yeah. six six. Like we're not talking about that guy. He's like that far. We're talking about your arguably your number two receiver on the team, and he broke his finger, and like the guys just happen to find out about it, and then they ask him, "What's up with your finger?" You know, like at some point, like you would think the Eagles might just be like, "Hey guys, before you go in the locker room, just wanted to let you know," like you know, it, it might be nice to have a little extra tra- transparency. Yeah, big time. It, it's weird that we're coming up here on such a big season, and football is nothing right now. There is no buzz surrounding the team. Like you said, Deshaun Jackson breaks a finger, and eh, we're not even talking about it, really. There is nothing, and I wonder if it's because we're too comfortable as a fan base, or is it because preseason just stinks that much? Or a little bit of both? I think it's three things. I think two of them are those three things. I think the fan base just presumes the Eagles could be good this year. And I think that level of complacency is what's going to cause an outcry, whether it's like week four or eight when they have like a bad loss, because every team has a bad loss every year. They're going to have a bad loss. Everyone's going to freak out, and we're going to have everybody texting and calling Mike Gill and Mason Aton and, and my show on Saturday, Sports Bash Saturday, and Billy Schwime and Pete Thompson, and everybody's going to get, this team, ah, yeah, everyone's going to freak out. So... I think, yes, there is a level of complacency where people just assume this is going to be a good team. I think, number two, the preseason has definitely left you just so wanting the season to start. I think the fact that we have seen more of guys who will never play in the NFL than guys who will play in the NFL in the preseason, I think that's exasperating. And there's a part of me that, look, I usually watch every preseason game, but this Thursday... You have a full college football slate. I won't watch one second of Eagles football. I, I'm leaning toward not watching the Eagles. Yeah, I won't. I'm, I say that, yet I'll watch maybe like the first drive. Like, do, do, the, do the Phillies play that night? No, they don't. They're off. Okay, so it's so even... I, I, I don't have the Phillies option to. Correct. So, But there are some college football games tonight. I think that for me, I, I might have... Okay, so here's what's probably going to happen. And text in at 609-403-0973. What are you going to do Thursday night? I'm probably going to have the Eagles on the radio, but I'll have college football on the TV. Wow. You do that? Oh, yeah. Well, that's because also, like, there's a lot of times that, like, you know, I'm I'm either still here at the station or, uh, you know, I'm in, in, you know, at the gym or I'm in my car, I'm at home, or I'm somewhere where there is also a place for me to listen to the radio. So... I could have that option of like, you know, dual platforms. I, I need the TV. I need the TV sound. That's important to me. I can't go Eagles preseason game four yet. I'm watching Clemson on TV. I, that's a violation. <laughs> well, to me. this time you can because they're playing Georgia Tech and it's a minus 36. You taking it? Big spreads scare me like that. Yeah, I think I spread a little too big. That That's one of those backdoor covers where like Georgia Tech scores with like two minutes left in the fourth quarter against Clemson's like third line. And like it ends up being like a thirty-three point win or something. Big time. <laughs> He's Hunter Brody. I'm Josh Henning.